It's Your Dime, a straight talk interview series presented by Shift Coleman. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. In this episode, I'll be talking to Dan Kurz of DK Analytics. We'll cover a wide range of topics, including the difference between bottom-up and top-down market investing, the genesis of DK Analytics, why and how Dan breaks down complex economic issues, looking for value in investing, where we are currently as an economy, gold as an investment, and silver and its relationship to gold. Welcome to It's Your Dime. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. And today we have with us Dan Kurz. He's actually coming to us all the way from Switzerland, where he has a second home. And he is the man who runs the website DK Analytics. And I don't know that you'll find any place with the in-depth economic analysis that you will find on his website. So I'm looking forward to talking to him a little bit about not only what he does and why he does it, but uh, maybe talking a little bit about the uh, economy as it stands today and investing. So Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. So it's uh, early afternoon, actually, I guess mid-afternoon there in, in Switzerland. We're here in the morning, so we're spanning the time zones here. Um Let's uh, just start off and give the viewers a little bit of your background uh, and how you got involved in doing this type of in-depth analysis that you will find on the DK Analytics website. Thank you, gladly. Well, I'm a CFA. I had a liberal arts background, heavy uh, concentration in economics and accounting and also politics. I ended up uh, going over to Switzerland when I was a young lad, uh, between college and, and possibly an MBA school. And uh, my mom told me, why don't you go grab a Swiss passport? I have dual lineage. So I went to Boston, got that, came over here, and wanted to vault myself into a top tier MBA school. And as I think we just mentioned the other day, plans, the best laid plans of men and mice sometimes aren't worth uh, all too much. And I ended up getting traction in the Swiss investment world, did my CFA, started my career more with bottom up this was uh, many decades back when we had still had uh, price discovery and markets that weren't so rigged so that the bottom up approach seemed to make more sense and then the last third of of my career here i hate that word but let me use it for lack of another one i shifted to more top down given the unbalanced and uh, suppressed state of many markets manipulation instead of price discovery that makes sense. Explain what you mean when you say talk about top down and, and bottom up. Uh, what, what do you what, do you, what does that mean? Well, I think in, in simplest terms, if you assume semi efficient markets, then you really have price discovery. You know, instead of algorithms and central banks determining by by uh, quantitative easing, or in this case. You know, purchasing a lot of bonds and thus uh, setting a higher bar for bond prices. And bond prices, by extension, determine to a large degree the net present value of stocks. If that is out of kilter and we have manipulation by central bankers, central planners, it takes away the ability to get rational values. I, I mentioned to you the fact that it's well known that the S&P is trading at 24, 25 times gap real earnings, not massaged earnings with you without that lack all the necessary portfolio adjustments that analysts on, on the street like to ignore, you know, bottom line earnings today are very expensive. The reason they're so expensive isn't because we've had a dramatically successful organic growth uh, decade, but rather in spite of that, it's financial engineering based. And when you're in a world where central bankers dictate to a large degree bond prices, then you also have stock prices that obviously reflect that. So you can't necessarily, to the same degree, go and say to yourself, OK, we have a relatively efficient market in which stocks supposedly trade based upon the int estimated intrinsic value of those projected earnings and cash flow streams. So if you're going out and trying to pick up diamonds in the rough, that might be mispriced. You know, the whole Graham Dodd discipline, the value investor discipline, 
that tends to get polluted or taken over by the big brush of massive uh, interventionism by central bankers. Interesting. And as you talk, I'm thinking, now I understand why you do analytics, because it's obvious that you have a, a, a very strong grasp of, of how all of these dynamics work together. How exactly did you get involved in, in what, what prompted you to put DK Analytics together? And folks can check that out at dkanalytics.com. And I encourage you to do so. Like I said, I'm not sure that you're going to find uh, this type of analysis anyplace else. Uh, how did you get involved in, in doing that? What kind of motivated you to start that website? Well, first of all, many thanks for the kind and generous words, Mike. Much appreciated. Um, I got started uh, by, I'm going to say hook or crook. I was a thematic strategist. I got a chance to work in the CIO office of Credit Suisse in Zurich, Switzerland, where I had a roughly a four and a half year tenure. I was in the thematic uh, arena. I had prior, prior to that been uh, employed by HSBC Geierzeller, a private bank taken over by this big 800 pound global gorilla, where I majored in bottom up, focusing on the fundamentals instead of on asset valuations dominated by central bankers. So when I got booted out of, of Credit Suisse, in plain English, I got fired because they stopped the thematic uh, approach. Because if you can imagine, you have a world dictated by uh, disciplines such as the equity guys, the Forex guys, the bond guys, the AI guys, alternative investments, which truly, if we look at it, are the real investments upon which stocks and bonds are built. Oil, timber, water, coal, what really drive together with technology and ability to generate a leveraged output. But my foray into DK Analytics and heading back to Southwest Florida where it's based, was driven by an agreement that I reached with a colleague uh, that I met at the local CFA chapter, Naples CFA Society. And we had an agreement that ended up uh, not working, whereas I would continue to publish and we would try to gather assets in Southwest Florida. That agreement, unfortunately, didn't work. Uh, I won't go into details. It's not the right venue. And then I decided to give it one more big full tilt push and seeing if I could actually earn a living through internet publishing, which is akin to uh, trying to reach the top of Mount Everest. <laughs> I, I totally understand that being involved in the uh, the world of internet marketing and and whatnot myself. That's a, it's a tough road, but I, I really do hope people discover what you're doing because I think it's an absolute necessity uh, in this day and age. You know, you watch the financial news and and you know the so-called news on cnbc and fox business and whatnot and you get all these little bits and pieces of of this and that and very rarely do you find any place that brings so many things together and i think people will discover if they go to your website dkanalytics.com they will find that you take uh so many different pieces of the puzzle and put them together in a coherent way that helps you get a bigger picture of what's going on in the economy. And it's, it's, it's fascinating to me just to, to see the end product. Uh, I would, I'm sure this, that I'm not even sure that you can articulate this, but I'm curious of how you put together a post. How do you put all of these puzzle pieces together? Well, that's a loaded question. Um, it's kind of like there's a topic I want to have a go at. And obviously, a lot of these topics are framed by a world where we've moved away from traditional liberalism, free market capitalism, sound money, rule of law. And we've moved, uh, thanks to the printing press in essence, and it always has the end result, uh, to an age where we unfortunately have uh, cronyism at whatever level we could get into that perhaps some other time. We have uh, takers that uh, whose interests are placed ahead of makers. We have massive misallocations, thanks to the fact that in essence, we can run a, an economic and monetary policy that wouldn't pay for itself in cash flow terms. In other words, we don't have the money to pursue insanity. So instead we pursue it via the printing press. And we essence create the money to pay for things that we couldn't. You look at green cronyism, you know, you look at uh, the, the huge redistributionism, 
you look at the uh, tarp you look at money printing what you have is a is a shift of the flow of the economy and its benefits and also its incentives and its signals away from the free market which is the best mechanism to drive productivity and the wealth of nations and the most people to the opposite you know in extreme sense you can call our system fascism we're getting very close to that so when i look under the hood i always say to myself in a world where paper and globally it isn't just america it's the feds the 800 pound gorilla but the bank of europe the bank of japan the bank of china all the big heavies are on board when you get into an age where in fact money printing is the answer to sustain the power of the elites the globalists the plutocrats whatever you want to call them and all their hangers on on k street wall street where have you then you find that assets are dangerously priced you know we talked in the interview uh we don't have reversion to the mean as sell side analysts often say we actually have reversion beyond the mean and if we take a look at our heavily manipulated asset price, especially bonds, stocks, and obviously real estate, which is tied into, into the yields, then you realize that there are very few places where you have a good chance of maintaining your capital, much less getting a sound return on it, at least based upon economics. And at the end of the day, and it's taken a long time, longer than anyone would care to believe, economics trumps politics. So if you're going to look for savings that you want to invest, one of the key tenets, at least people that believe in fundamental analysis and honesty and integrity, is to purchase something which has a, a certain cushion between the estimated intrinsic value and the market value or the enterprise value, if you will, if you want to add net debt. And when you look at it from that perspective, you find very few things that can be bought that promise both return of capital. You remember Will Rogers is not the re return on capital, it's the return of capital accounts. And it, it, that inevitably pushes you into commodities, into certain foreign markets that par perhaps have a better uh, system, less cronyism, you know, less manipulation. And, it, you know, Mike, I think, a short answer after this long detour is you look for value. You look for value based on traditional measurements where you have a sound return prospect, where you're unlikely to lose your capital, or where it's likely to be impaired for only a short period of time. And given the bond and stock and, and real estate bubbles that the central bank policies have brought about by definition, it's difficult you know, I majored in the first half of my career, I was purchasing stocks because they made a lot more sense. But in a world today where we're in a 37 year bull market in bonds, where we're at the bottom, and at some point we're gonna tilt up and we're gonna overshoot, both bonds and stocks as generic asset classes are by extension massively overvalued. So you can get on and hope that the greater fool theory or the election of Donald Trump or God knows what makes it even more outrageously valued. But for someone that, that, that values capital preservation and wants to establish a good chance to have actual real rates of return, capital gains or dividends or both, it drives you into a very limited asset class by definition. And that asset class, globally stated, tends to be commodities, which are very, which are rare and indispensable. And obviously that's the energy complex, that's the water and ag complex. And if you wanna get into real money, that's silver and gold. So it, it by definition puts you into a universe of assets for not a speculator, not a punter, not a day trader, not a 30 to 60 day moving average has been broken and on the up or the downside. But someone that is interested in perceiving his investment as something that he can hang his hat on and five, 10 years later, not only have his money back, his purchasing power intact, but to experience a real yield, improved purchasing power, because that's why we invest money in the first place. Makes sense to me. Uh, I appreciate, appreciate the detail on that answer. And I think the audience, again, is going to get a sense of what you do on DK Analytics just by virtue of your answers. I mean, 
I don't, I don't mean to fawn, but I, I'm really, I really do enjoy the fact that you break things down to such a, a minute level. And I think it's an important thing. I think we live in a, in a world today where everything's put into 30 second sound bites or, you know, a, a, a tweet. And I think we miss a lot of the big picture of what's going on in the world because we don't do this kind of in-depth analysis and thinking we don't put all of the uh, pieces together. We don't, create a coherent whole whole so we were kind of moved uh hither tither by whatever the news of the day to, happens to be and you know like speaking of news of the day just uh, yesterday as we record this the federal reserve decided they're going to boost interest rates uh again and so everybody's all a twitter about interest rates and it was interesting listening to jerome powell the fed chairman he was so bullish about the u.s economy and everything's great we're moving forward we're he's projecting bigger growth and I'm curious, uh, and this is probably a, a way bigger question than we can get into real in depth in this interview, but I'm curious of what your view of, of where we are as an economy. Are we really, you know, are we really bulls as far as the eye can see, or do you see something else coming down the road uh, in the economy? If I could uh, take liberty of making one comment about uh, my posts, and I thank you very much for, for, for your kind words about them. I, what I try to do that might be a bit different. You know, everybody tries to bring something to the party that's worth uh, people's time. And in the headlines and the big picture uh, composites, I bring the bottom line. But what I try to do is also offer lots of source lots of links, either through previous work where I might have gone into depth on this, that, or the other. I try to use statistics that are available by governments. In other words, go to the source. Those statistics oftentimes, and that leads me right into the Jerome Powell uh, remark or question, uh, are heavily massaged and increasingly so, which is unfortunate, because, but it goes hand in hand in the loss of honest money. Right, we no longer have honest inflation statistics. We don't have honest unemployment statistics. In Germany, and it's not just the U.S. In Germany and in, in England, they have even included uh, a prostitution revenues in their GDPs to bump up the growth rate. So you know, it it just gets more and more iffy. All right, and as to the economic statistics and economic growth and unemployment rate, I would say this, and I wrote about this and you or a colleague were kind enough to carry this or republish it. When Donald Trump ran for office, he said that the unemployment rate was BS, the inflation rate was BS, the GDP growth rate was BS. Obviously, if you have an understated inflation rate, you're going to have an overstated real GDP growth rate. If you're coming into office in middle America, the red states, in essence, voted for Trump because they felt that their pocketbooks, they felt when they had to pay Obamacare premiums, that something was not right and they were losing their butts, pardon my French, in the midst of this supposed economic recovery. Well, I really don't think much has changed. In other words, we continue to put out way too many regulations. Uh, up to four to 5,000 a year that are brought out not by the legislative branch where they should be domiciled exclusively, but in essence by the executive branch. And the EPA has been the toughest of this. And, and we know that the current head of it is trying to carve this thing up and, and get rid of this bureaucratic overreach. So what is my point? If, if we have an economy that is still heav heavily encumbered by regulatory overreach, notwithstanding some of Trump's initiatives, which are good to reduce this. Heck, we've added for 10, 15 years about 5,000 new regulations a year, which in effect are laws with stiff penalties. If we run afoul of them, we might not even know what they are. But if we take the regulatory compliance costs, we talked about this, uh, defined by U.S. Manufacturers Association, it's damn near $2 trillion a year. Damn near $2 trillion a year. That's almost 10% of the GDP, which we used to call GNP before we started running such large trade deficits, but that's another story. But if we have a regulatory quagmire, if we have a litigation environment, which is where litigation costs for corporations is roughly three times or two and a half times what Europe pays, 
if we continue to go forward with misallocations, thanks either to political correctness or green cronyism, and to new the very dense energy sources and adequacy that we need to drive productivity forward and extension of our output through putting dense energy to work in machinery, then in essence, we are or we remain extremely dependent upon the printing press to keep this thing going because we don't have a reform. Instead of less government, we have more government. Instead of less regulations, we're top heavy there. We're top heavy litigation wise. We still major in misallocations thanks to all this money that's been printed and given all the political correctness. So if anything, taking away this money printing by the Fed as we ramp up debt to levels unheard of and grow government spending despite the promises to do the other makes this recovery so-called which really isn't if you measured it with a fair inflation rate we probably never would have broken across into the into 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 positive numbers but it makes this recovery even more fragile some of that has been offset by more animal spirits with trump with small businesses getting bullish but we cannot really get back to a healthy economic growth environment unless we revisit the tenets of free market capitalism. And we're not going there. So in my book, what's going on now is leading us ever more quickly off the cliff. And that probably will be responded to the only tools the Fed ever has, which is pushing interest rates at the short end back down. And I'm willing to bet revisiting QE or money printing, possibly at an absolutely unheard of rate. Because remember, the Fed's balance sheet is only 0.9% equity. The Fed holds more mortgage bonds than any other entity, 1.8 or $2 trillion worth. We know what happens in a recession to these homes that are highly geared, have little equity. They end up going belly up. And those kind of losses the Fed will have to realize, it can hold things, doesn't need the market to market. But if the Fed has to realize losses, that could quickly take its 0.9% equity cap, literally, and push it into the red. And in effect, you'd have a bankrupt Fed. That isn't gonna happen. They can't let it happen, which gives me the assurance that Jerome Powell is just stating things that are ridiculous, either for propaganda reasons or because of Keynesian indoctrination. It's interesting. You mentioned the kind of cooked numbers that we get out of government agencies. And I just wrote an article this week on the Shift Gold website, shiftgold.com slash news. And it talked about the fact that looking at the CPI numbers for used cars, it actually yeah. says, according to the numbers, that a used car costs the same today as it did in 1994. So that CPI number has been uh, basically held steady. And the reason is, is every time that there's a quote unquote innovation in a car, then they calculate that into the CPI number. So right. even though you're paying more money, they say, right. oh, well, you have cruise control or you have uh, you know, yes. a computer. So therefore, your car is worth more. And so that they cook the numbers. They say, well, the price has been steady. Well, it hasn't been steady. Anybody that's bought a used car knows that it hasn't been steady. And and we see this repeated, not, you know, it's not just used cars. We yeah. see it repeated in, in everything. And I think you're right. I've, I've heard people say that, you know, we could we could have inflation rates in, in the certainly in the double digits, uh, in, in you know, just an incredible amount of inflation in the system that is completely ignored by the central bankers and and the uh, economic pundits. Let's kind of shift gears a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about gold since uh, this is a shift gold uh, interview series. And uh, I would just like to kind of get real quick your uh, philosophy on gold and how gold plays into your investment strategies. Well, gold, as I mentioned earlier, is it, it, it's, it's a commodity, a very rare commodity, a priceless commodity, an indestructible commodity. It's also has a value on its own that people have recognized when shifting from barter, they went to money and gold and to a lesser degree, silver fulfilled that role. And it's withstood the time, the test of time since the Persian empire. And my last post goes into that. In other words, over thousands and thousands of years, people have wanted this, 
have held it. It's compact, it's indestructible, it's beautiful. Uh, and that really is the best source of money or the, with which to anchor representations thereof. You know how the goldsmiths used to have uh, the gold or the, or the silver, and then they would issue you a certificate and that set certificate was fully backed. Well, we've gone away from that for a long time. And we're in a world where obviously central bankers determine uh, what money is, and they they have taken legal tender laws that the Constitution uh, declared was only at the state level gold or silver, and they've made an absolute mockery of forced fiat money, which at this point is totally untethered or detached from the discipline of above ground gold and silver. But as history shows and repeats time and time again that they will print when they can until money becomes worthless because the po power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And those people that control money, as I think JP Morgan or some illustrious giant said, you know, I don't care who makes the laws or maybe it was the Rothschilds, just give me control over what constitutes money. And all the misallocations, the debt mountains, these are all actually the prodigy, the end result of us losing discipline in money. Gold and silver, you tend to get them out of the ground at a rate which approximates real GDP growth, say population growth of 1%, productivity growth of 1%, which we've ruined thanks to all this money printing and we're heading towards zero. But gold and silver, by extension, poor man's gold are great. Um, monetary assets that have been beaten up for a long time through naked short selling, through the powers that be. It. But the point is, we know that this doesn't last. Even manipulations don't last. And if one takes a look at the global increase in the central bank balance sheets between 15 and 16 trillion dollars over 10 years, we take a look at debt which is typically leveraged five, 10 to one, it's up 70 trillion, all right? One year's global GDP is about $70 trillion. So within 10 years, we have added global debt at all levels, governmental, corporate, private. That is the equivalent of one year's worth of global GDP. In other words, our debt to GDP is through the roof, and that is also furthered by the printing press which in turn allows us to pursue insane policy that policies that are the antithesis of free market capitalism, wealth of nations, price discovery, and a floating boat or a you know, rising tide for the most people involved. So gold hasn't lost this attribute. It's just been covered up by the powers that be. It's been neglected. People bought the Trump rally. They figured, you know, Obama was bad. And, and I couldn't agree more, but they thought Donald Trump was a savior. Well, this guy is, 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 is not necessarily a savior. He, he's the guy that's going to grow government spending faster than even Obama did. And if we look at tariffs, which is the ultimate form of crony capitalism, because it benefits a few industries at the expense of everyone else that takes that steel, takes that lumber, takes that aluminum, and has to pay, a, a, like the sugar industry, an above world clearing price it's going to hurt all kinds of component manufacturers. So what I'm, I guess I'm trying to say is we're in no position to think that gold or silver are a barbarous relic. To the contrary, I think they are extremely good places to put money for portfolio insurance protection, number one. In other words, if your bonds and stocks suddenly get cut in half, which can easily happen. Remember, we go not reversion to the mean. We don't go from a 3% yield to 4.5% 10-year treasury. We'll go to 8 or 9. We're not going to go from PEs of 24 to an average of 15. We're going to go to 7 or 8 or sub-10 into the single digits, which will then, for the blue chip companies that can afford to pay us a yield, afford us a 6, 7, 8% dividend yield. You know, the Nestle's, the 3M's of the world, the guys that can afford to pay that dividend. But what I think gold and silver, which I believe thanks to the, you know, the financial imaginations of the globe central banks and, uh, and the result that we no longer have intelligent investment, we have 
uh, traders that run on algos. We have people focused on what's more expensive is more valuable instead of the opposite. Every housewife knows when they got a sale on, 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 on uh, you know, on toilet paper, you back up the truck, you buy more, not less. In our world, we do the opposite. And gold is, and silver by extension, in my view, not only a good place as a refuge in case portfolios suffer what I think is going to be a 30 to 50 to 60, 70 percent correction in the value of stocks and bonds, but it's likely to be money on steroids because, and we mentioned this the other day, if you consider global investable assets, bonds about two thirds, stocks a little less than one third, AI the remaining five, six percent. When we take a look at gold and silver, that's not even 0.7%, it's about 0.6%. So even if we have just a little shift in all the global money managers, despite their charters forbidding them from holding physical gold, their charters will allow them to hold ETFs. And those ETFs will sooner or later discover that all these promises for physical gold can't be met. They're probably overstated 100 to one, 200 to one, whatever. And those things will come together the realization that the emperor wears no clothes, faith, loss of faith in this insanity that we call our modern day Keynesian monetary policy to, in essence, cause gold and silver at some point, not just to catch up to all the money that's been printed, but possibly to go into overdrive because trying to get an allocation of 1% instead of 0.6% would require nine years of gold mining at current gold prices. So if we step back and say we know things go boom bust, we know people go with crowds, if all of a sudden portfolio managers feel they need to have an exposure to gold, they'll get it via paper. The paper won't be money good because there isn't the underlying physical to support it. And then the only way to get that allocation up is through a higher clearing price and higher equilibrium price. And that obviously will strongly benefit those people that have gold, physical gold and silver insurance policies, I think 10, 15% of an investable net worth is a damn good idea. You could probably go higher. And then when that gold and silver go up, paper assets are going to take it on the chin. You will have money on steroids, I think, that's my belief, right or wrong, that you will then be able to use, not only are you going to the treasury, three month treasuries, which you're going to call pretty safe assets. They don't have any duration risk. But you probably get this huge run up in gold, the opposite of what we've seen. You know, the suppression manipulation comes to an end. You've got everyone piling in and there's hardly anything there and people have a very low allocation to it. It all comes together. And then that repriced gold, the big reset, if you will, relative to bonds and stocks will enable you to possibly purchase bonds and stocks at lifetime advantageous prices. Bonds yielding six, seven, eight, nine percent. Stocks with a PE of six, seven, eight, yielding seven, eight percent. That's when you can then migrate back. I mean, gold as we know is not an investment for return. By the same token, a lot of today's government bonds don't bring you any return either but they are in essence junk bonds masquerading as investment grades. So the opportunity cost of not being in bonds is very low because the yields aren't there. But we sidestep both the sovereign default risk and the long-term monetary inflation risk because the only way that the powers that be are gonna address this is not by telling people your pensions are no good, by saying Detroit goodbye, they're going to print the money and to make people good, currency debasement will be expanded upon and that will be what really makes gold and silver go wild in my estimation. So great asset as insurance and in our current dynamic, our current situation might also be a great place to, to be invested in money on steroids for the inevitable bargains that we're going to see down the road and in, in stock and bond markets. You made an interesting point that I think a lot of people miss 
they look at a market and they'll look at gold and silver right now and they'll say, oh, well, you know, it's been kind of range bound or it hasn't been doing as well as stocks. And, you know, it's just we're not interested in it. It's just not. Do and, and really, this is the time to buy when things are on sale. You know, when things are low, that's when smart people buy. Like, like you said, you know, my, my wife does this. When there's a big sale, she'll come home with a carload of toilet paper. Right. Uh, yeah. And uh, I wanted to to kind of wrap up with with one final question relating to the relationship between gold and silver. Uh, the last post you did actually uh, focused in on silver, and I'm interested in silver because um, I actually just found a bunch of uh, of old <coughs> silver coins. Congratulations! Yeah. yeah. So uh, Peter Schiff has talked a little bit about this. The fact that the silver gold ratio uh, right now, I think it's in the I'm not sure what it is today. It's been as high as 81 or so to one, which is uh, very high from a historical standpoint. And and Peter has described this as silver on sale. And I'm curious what your thoughts are uh, on the relationship between gold and silver right now and, and how you see silver uh, moving here in the next few years. Because I think a lot of people focus on gold and they don't think a whole lot about silver. Silver is kind of like the, the forgotten stepbrother. Good question, uh, and I, I, Peter, as we both know, makes in unbelievably uh, insightful and useful podcast, and uh, he's a giant in this entire industry and realm. And I, uh, for better or worse, I hope for better, agree. I believe with his assessment that silver, uh, given its current valuation, I mean, the silver to gold ratio is close to eighty-one. It might be seventy-eight to one. It's narrowed a bit. Historically, it comes out of the ground uh, 10 ounces of silver to one ounce of gold. The Constitution fixed it at 15 silver to one ounce gold. The French afterwards in the bimetallic period went 15.5 to one. But in essence, it's more or less ape how it came out of the ground. Now, you can't go one for one because there's other cost issues. But let's, for the sake of simplicity, say that that is probably a good yardstick. If we look at silver, a lot of silver has been used about 60% in industrial uses. You know, with the photovoltaic, we've had, you know, we lost photography, we have soldering, we have circuits, you know, iPhone, the content and all electronics is a lot of silver. And unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately for a buyer of silver or a holder or a stacker, however you want to call it, the fact that silver is more scattered above ground and tougher to get back into melt form at today's silver prices make silver actually considerably more scarce at least in terms of how much there is if you attach a dollar price tag to it it's about three percent four percent of readily available gold right and so from my perspective if you look at silver from two angles number one until 1964 and through 67, U.S. dollar notes, treasury notes, not Federal Reserve notes, were, were silver certificates where you literally had the right through 1964 to demand from the U.S. Treasury silver. So silver is has stayed money, at least in a nominal sense, much longer in the U.S. than it did elsewhere. I think silver is also people's money. I think gold is the money of central bankers and silver will at some point be remonetized. You know all the state initiatives where we've got repositories going up. You're stopping taxation. You're going back to the constitution. You know, the first clause, I think it's, it, it, it's uh, the 10th uh, article that goes into the fact that states should only use gold and silver and along those 15 to 1 lines. So there's a lot lined up for silver going forward, including, and this also pertains to gold, increasing difficulty in getting it out of the ground. And this increasing difficulty is thanks to a bonanza of silver mining, in turn thanks to technology and capitalization of fossil fuels that leveraged output through machinery, construction equipment, and drilling and whatnot that we didn't have. So going forward, I think silver will at least carry forward gold's 
increase. Again, in nominal dollar terms or in Swiss franc terms or whatever you call it. And I think gold is going in the direction of five to ten thousand dollars. I think if you go five to tenfold from today's gold price levels, I think you're going to see silver do that and possibly a lot more. How so? Because there is a demand for silver in the industrial arena that gold doesn't have because silver is more scattered thanks to its industrial usage. And also because silver tends to be people's money. And as people around the world, not only in the East, and they already know it, but also in the West are a bit discombobulated about what I think is stagflation in the making and a tough job market to get good paying jobs, they're going to go back to a source uh, that preserves wealth well over time and they can use also as an insurance policy against the declining dollar, which is a given based upon the monetary policies that I think will soon be reinitiated on the QE side. So silver is always soft called poor man's gold. I think silver will go in the direction of closing its current 80 to 1 silver to one ounce of gold gap, or, or I'm sorry, 80, 80 times as valuable as an ounce of, of gold. But I also think, frankly, Mike, that part of it will be limited for quite a while. Maybe we'll get back to a bimetallic standard, but silver is a lot more volatile. But here's the good news. If you want to back this massive explosion and monetary basis of the globe with gold, and say you do it instead of at the central balance sheet level, you do it at the money supply level. If you took the leading nations in the world, either at the central balance bank balance sheet level or the money supply level, and you back this with gold to reinstill confidence, what you would have is gold probably near $10,000. Silver, as said, was not only going to go along for the ride, but I think silver has tremendous upside potential relative to gold given the scarcity above ground scarcity scattering how it comes out of the ground and and very profound and growing industrial uses so you have both sides you have a return and monetary aspect and you have pretty strong industrial usage outstanding well dan i really appreciate you taking the time to talk uh real quick give people uh a uh, overview of where they can contact you website and email if you want to give that or any social media uh, where can absolutely find well thank you very much mike i greatly appreciate it and uh i my site as you've mentioned a few times thank you for that is www.dkanalytics.com i got very creative i took my first name first initial and my last name dk dan kurz so it's www.dkanalytics.com. You can also write me directly. My email address there is simply dan at dkanalytics.com. Uh, I, I do some YouTube videos once in a while. I've disassociated myself with, from the Facebooks of the world because I, I am into, uh, you know, I, I'm afraid that people are getting access to data that they shouldn't. And I don't think those platforms are very usable for where I'm trying to go. So it's in essence YouTube and my site or the email address, which again is dan at dkanalytics.com. Well, Dan, thank you again. I appreciate having you on. Love to have you on again. Maybe we can uh, do some issue specific episodes in the future and, and dig into some of these uh, some of these different issues more in depth. Would love to do that. And uh, again, I thank you for your time and wish you all the best. Have a great afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity, Mike. Look forward to chatting again. You've been watching It's Your Dime, an interview series presented by Shift Gold. For more information on investing in gold and silver, talk to a Shift Gold precious metal specialist today at 1-888-GOLD-160. That's 1-888-465-3160. Or visit us on the web at shiftgold.com. You can keep up with all of the latest precious metals news at shiftgold.com slash news and tune in each week to the Shift Gold Friday Gold Wrap Podcast. This is your host, Mike Meharry. I appreciate you watching and I'll talk to you again next time.